All right. Good morning. Welcome to the session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Then we get into our class. Father, we thank you for, once again for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for your praise. Lord, we thank you for, for uh, just giving us this ability to learn and study and grow, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that even as we uh, study about uh, church planting and as we go about, Lord, planning and preparing, God, I pray for your wisdom. Pray, God, that you will give us ideas, strategies, open doors for us, God, at the right time. Lord, uh, we, we just pray, God, that uh, you will, Lord, put a new vision in our hearts, a, a new desire to uh, to grow in the things of God. We thank you, Lord. We, we just submit this class into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've been talking about uh, uh, last class. We did the launch phase a little bit about the launch phase. We looked at how uh, you know the, the the launch is just once, and also uh, once the launch is done, it can be done in two different ways: either in a simple way, uh, in a small setting, or you, the launch could be done as big promotion, gospel meeting, a healing service. Uh, and then we also looked at keeping the first service uh, very simple, but the first service is very important because it is at this service that uh, you know uh, it is where you can set your priorities, you set goals, you share your expectations, and also people get to know what is it that you expect as a church, as a vision for the church, right? And then also we shared about follow up. Right, so uh, follow up is very critical when it comes to, uh, you know, especially when the church is small, you're growing. Follow up is very important, right? So something that we followed APC welcome call, follow up call one, follow up call two, and then if they're interested, we connect them to a volunteering team, or if they say no, we, I'd like to go to another church, we release them. We don't hold people. We don't. Uh, force people to come or manipulate, uh, but we allow them to make the choice. And we also looked briefly at chapter 12, which was uh, strategies for urban evangelism. And we stopped at uh, identifying and developing strategies. Right. So let's pick up from here. Now, there's five points here under develop, identifying and developing strategies. First one is developing strategies for different age groups right now for example our children um till they leave high school say they're about till 16 or 17 years old uh, so how can we minister to children in that age group right now we do know like everywhere you know christians have schools right something that we are always known for. There are a lot of Christian schools in every part of our nation, and I'm sure also in other nations. Right? So what does it do? It gives us an opportunity to knock on doors. They say, maybe you know, you, you, you're two, three years into the ministry, you have, you, you, you've planted the church, and God is beginning to open up doors. So it gives us an opportunity to reach out to schools, Right. Uh, something that we do at APC is uh, uh, is a program called the Catalyst. Right. So Catalyst is where uh, most Christian schools what they have is um, you know uh, an hour for scripture studies or scripture learning. Right? And so we, as a team, Catalyst team, they go and they teach children on scriptures, right? Bible stories, Bible. Uh, topics and these are covered over the entire academic year. Now, what is happening? Uh, number one is when we are doing this, we are sowing seeds at a young age, right? You know, so children between maybe you can say even eight. I would I know the notes say ten to fourteen, but even children from eight years old. You know, I got an eight-year-old son, and the questions that he asks are. In terms of you know Bible and, and, and God, very high question. So uh, eight to fourteen, right? Uh, we are sowing seeds into their heart, um, and and we believe that those seeds will grow. And 
uh, we started Catalyst, uh, I think it was 2008, uh, when we started Catalyst, where we started going into schools and uh, we would get probably, I think it was two hours in a week and different sections, right? So you got from uh, the primary section all the way up to the high school section. Uh, and and we used to go, we, we still do it. We still go minister to these children. But what is the question that we can ask ourselves, right? Once a door is open, we need to be effective when God opens a door for us. Right? We can't just say, okay, God's opened a door. We can't go and keep telling them stories. Right? That's not what we want to do. We want to make that one hour, that 15 minutes fruitful. So what are some of the challenges that children face? So we got to do a little bit of uh, work there. Right? We got to think about it. We got to uh, read, uh, look at what, uh, you know, what's happening in the society, in the city that you're in. Um, one of the challenges that we face in urban uh, cities is uh, children at the age of 10. And I know this because we speak to a lot of uh, families who have uh, children between 10 to 18. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, social media, a uh, use of uh, social media. And so we got children who are even six and seven years old who know how to use a phone. They know how to get into apps. They know how to download apps. They know how to use apps. Um, and, and you know, sometimes social media becomes a place where they, you know, they, they, they find their identity from. Okay, how come they are able to, but I'm not able to do this, or they are doing this, or even I must do this. So this peer pressure, there's, uh, uh, lack of uh, identity or lack of, uh, uh, of, of, you know, this feeling of insecurity coming into children at a very, very young age, right? So what are some of the other challenges that children face? Uh, it could be uh, in terms of studies. Obviously, children are going to study all the way uh, up to their uh, youth as well. So studies could be a challenge um, uh, or even in terms of being uh, obedient or being kind to one another. So these are simple topics, but these are challenges that children are facing, right? And what are the strategies that as a church we can develop to reach that audience? And so some of the topics that we talk about uh, in children's, uh, in terms of catalyst is there's, there's peer pressure, there's, uh, you know, uh, obedience and there's, there's, there's a vast variety of topics right uh, so we can do that and again when we are teaching all of this we bring in christian values we bring in the word of god uh, we bring in what the scripture says so it's not just stories but it's scripture it's based on the bible so that is one uh, age group and then you have the youth 18 to 25 now children and youth have very different concerns, right? Now, uh, children, you know, they do things because we, as parents, we tell them and they do it. They don't do it, we know how to correct them, right? To make them do it. But once they youth, 18 to 25, we tell them it's their choice because, you know, they grown up. Now they're going through many uh, physical changes, they're going through hormonal changes, they're uh, emotionally, they could be up or down. Uh, in, in terms of their studies, uh, academically, uh, then, you know, 18 to 25 is an age where a lot of the youth are very concerned about how they look, how they speak, uh, uh, what are their talents. Uh, these are things that they're very, very concerned about. Right? Uh, so how do I invite or how do I encourage the youth? How can I minister to them? What are, you know, 18 to 25 also, some of them have great aspirations. They want to, uh, you know, they they want to, they have big visions, they have great plans, uh, but there are some things that can stop them, hinder them. It could be financial things, it could be uh, their own self, like emotions. And so they're going through a whole, you know, their life is all going, there's ups and downs. Uh, but what strategies we can develop for you? So uh, I, I just share some of the strategies that we can have, especially for youth, is 
uh, so what we call is, you know, we have life groups, right? So uh, something that we like to do is youth meetings, youth life groups. And it's, again, it's a very informal gathering, right? So it's not like, uh, you know, come on, let's sit, open your Bible, let's read the verse and chapter. No, it's, it's very informal. Uh, and youth want to talk about present day, what is happening. Uh, they want, uh, you know, talks about how they can, uh, you know, improve their life, how uh, present day, they, they, they're they not too interested in uh, all these outdated stuff. They want what is happening in the now. So you got the Gen Z, uh, you, you got those languages that are there right now. And, uh, uh, you know, my little one is eight years old. And so he comes up with all these, uh, you know, they hear this from the, the, the kids who are elder, right, who are, uh, in their senior school. Uh, uh, so he comes up and he, he asked me some something about some word uh, and I had no clue what it is. And it's apparently some Gen Z language, right? But uh, now I have to go back and read up about Gen Z language so that I'd be able to correct him and know whether what he's saying is right or wrong. And uh, uh, I need to be on track with what he's learning. So, so the same way, when you and I, uh, as ministries, we get opportunities. We must be ready. Right? Now, listen, uh, this is very important. God will open the door. God will give us the opportunity. But when the opportunity comes, it is our responsibility on how we prepare and how we do well in that opportunity. Right? So you get youth concerts, you have youth meetings, you have uh, just one-on-one uh, -on -one talks, uh, this very informal times. But I remember this one time, we uh, we went to this uh, college. We said, we want to do a Christmas carol concert. Right now, this was a Christian college. Uh, but so we said, see, you have the auditorium. We'll bring our own equipment, our own instruments. All you have to do, all you, if you can get all the students together in the auditorium, we'll do a Christmas cattle concert. Uh, we'll, and then uh, after the concert, we'll just share a small five minute message about Christmas. And then, uh, you know, we, we have some free books. If they'd like to take, they can take. Now, being a Christian college, they were fine with it. They said, okay, you you can come. Uh, and, and now we've got the permission. So how do we go? We can't go and sing songs which were there in the 1990s. We can go and sing jingle bells. They're not going to be happy with that. Right? So it's a Christmas concert. So we knew we had to get their attention. We knew a few things. One, the songs need to be good. Two, the music needs to be good. Three, it should be relevant to the people who are there, the youths who are there. And then we also had to prepare for the message, the five minute message. You got five minutes to bring the message of Christ, of Christmas. Now you got about 600 students sitting there. Maybe only 10% of them are Christians, but the others are all from other faiths. How can we minister to them? How can we be effective in what we're going to do? Right, very important. That's why I remember we went back. This was, I think, 2015 or 16. We went back. We formed a team. Uh, many, many weeks of practice. I first listened to a lot of the, the contemporary Christian uh, Christmas songs and contemporary songs. Learned those songs. To, went for practices and uh, made sure that we had a good equipment, good sound system. Uh, and then we did the whole concert. We sh we shared the Christmas message, and the team in the in the college they really liked it. They said, "Can you do one thing? Can you come every year, right, and do this?" So we said, "Yeah, we're, we're fine. We can come every year and do this." Right, and then they said, "Okay, not only this. Can you also come and teach life skills?" Now, you can't use the name of Jesus, but you can use the word God and you can use scriptures. Uh, but life skills, one hour, every month, one hour. I said, okay, fine. Now, then we got opportunities in other colleges. 
right? So they said, why don't you, uh, you know, come and do a Christmas concert even for us? And why don't you also come and teach us life skills and teach us to teach the students on scriptures? Then we got opportunities in other colleges where they said, you know, most of our students are going through uh, drug addictions, going through suicidal tendencies. Can you come? Do you have a topic on that? We said, yes. Um, and so over time, it all started small. That's one door, right? Over time, we were able to, you know, open up and the ministry, like a whole ministry began, right? To do it. And we later called it uh, uh, Campus Elevate, right? So, yeah, and so we were able to reach out now. Uh, but it's very important to know who is the audience you're ministering to, right? Uh, so some of the youth events you can do is uh, coffee day events, campus elevates, youth concerts, campus groups and colleges and hostels, uh, Bible study uh, uh, groups in hostels and colleges. Right? So that's uh, these are options that you can you know do. Now I know that in the when you just launched, uh, you know your focus is the church. Your focus is okay, build the church. Um, yes, but over time, I'm talking about maybe even if it's a year, even if it's more than a one or two years down the line, uh, God will open doors. Now, don't say, God, no, let the church grow, then I'll do that. No. God is open door. Just get into it right? and be ready with uh, you know strategies of how you can reach out. Uh, now, if God has opened the door, God will also provide for volunteers and leaders and people to help you. Uh, fulfill it right uh, so that also just it's a it's a whole trusting god right? you gotta trust god that god will uh bring people then you got the young adults you got special seminars preparing for marriage life skills workplace groups uh professional conferences right something that we have in uh, uh that we have at atc here is uh uh christian leaders conference right so Sorry, uh, professionals conference where people from the professional, from the corporate sectors, people who are leading their own businesses, who are working, uh, they come and we have a one day event on how to be good uh, professionals, how to instill uh, godly values, godly principles in the work that we're doing. So these are uh, other options. Then we have married families, so marriage courses. Uh, chrysalis counseling, marriage seminars, women's conference, men's conference. Uh, these are, again, ways to reach out. Right? Uh, senior citizens, so visiting, uh, this is something what we do with life groups, uh, or what we call cell groups. So here, uh, you know, we visit old age homes, maybe once in a month or once in two, three months, they visit an old age home, be a blessing and come back right uh, okay so let's go to the second option right first one we just looked at it different age groups so you got children you got teens youth uh, uh, young adults uh, married couples and then senior citizens now the second strategy is addressing the need of the place of the city right now when it comes to migrants, right, uh, those who come into the city from another place, either for education or for a job, provide a community that helps and cares for them. Now, how can we do that? Right now, now there are people who come from different cities. They come into our city. Right now, uh, they could be people who are. The list is here. There's uh, suicidal, drug addiction, some of them seeking jobs, some of them financial guidance, some of them are homeless. So we have different, uh, you know, different areas of need in every city. Again, it's very important to understand this, right? We are not taking the place of God. We're not saying, okay, we can do, we will help out everyone all the time. It may not happen, right? Because here's the thing: you, you, when we start a ministry, it takes time to build, and as we keep building, then God begins to open doors, right? So when we address needs in the city, 
we're talking about it. We're helping people, right? So for example, here's what we did at uh, you know, 2020 COVID hit. We thought, okay, how can ABC be a blessing? I'm not sure if you've heard of what happened, but what we did was we had something called as a COVID relief fund, right? So uh, this is all funded by the church, church people, church, our congregation, and uh, and they, you know, they donated. And we used that fund to bless pastors and leaders across our nation. How did we bless them? We provided them either. Uh, uh, with food, with clothing during that time. Uh, uh, some of them, we also provided the, the money for their children's education. Now, again, everything was done in a way, everything was checked, right? It was not like, okay, some anyone can say I'm a pastor and then we would support them. No, we would check, okay, are they really a pastor? Are they really doing a ministry? Is, is their ministry established or is, is their ministry, are they reaching out to people? Do they really have a family? Do they, uh, you know, how long has the church been uh, uh, serving? Right? And uh, are they being funded by any other place? So we did a, like a little bit of a background check. It's not wrong. It's not like we don't have faith in them, but it's just being wise because this is God's money. So we'll be wise. Right? So there will come a time when you may be able to minister to people right? or provide for people. So you can go ahead and do that. And even as you do that, be careful that good actions and good intentions are not misunderstood. Now, over time, there will be many misunderstandings, right? So this other ministry may misunderstand, other people may misunderstand. And because our good intentions are to maybe bless people, but sometimes it's misunderstood. So the way we do these things, these good intentions, we need to be wise, right? Be wise in how you do it. For example, a simple example, whatever you do, every transaction, make it an online transaction. What happens? Everything is on. It's, it's there. You want to go back to it? And then if you want to make, uh, uh, you want to do any conversations, always have it on email. So nobody can say, but you said this. We have it on email. Go back to the email, find the email. It's there. And that's the simple things, being wise. right? And then we have the seven mountain, third one. So, uh, strategies addressing different spheres of activity. The seven mountains or the seven fears, spheres of influence. Education, arts and entertainment, media, business, government, family, and religion. Right. Now, if you look at it over, if you look at from the early 1990s till about the early 2000s, uh, or even before that, but what I'm trying to say is uh, the church has always kept away from engaging in this seven mount series of influence. Now, there could be many reasons why because we never prayed for god to open a door two we always thought that that is you know uh, we have this thing right uh, ministry or, or full-time ministry and that is a secular job so we have that mindset right uh, or we, we always thought that you know that that is separate to ministry but over time over the years, what's happened is people have changed. Mindsets have changed. Okay, you're in the workplace, but you can also do ministry. You're in the workplace, but you can also be a good believer and be a testimony there. So this whole mindset of full-time ministry and secular job is changing. So with this change, how do we address or how do we permeate and penetrate into the seven spheres? Education, we talked about it, right? We can, you know, knock on doors, go to schools, go to colleges, right? Arts and entertainment, right? We can use arts and entertainment to uh, to reach out to people, right? So, for example, we have, uh, 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 you know, a person who is a very influential dancer, right? Uh, 
Yeah, and he's he's you know on one of the top in our nation, and he goes to different places and uh, a very good dancer, and he uh, is a believer, so he's able to you know reach out to people. He he shares the gospel, he shares his testimony. Then we have also uh, a couple of uh, our church folks who are uh, in the music industry. They are the best in the music industry and very well known, very famous across. Uh, the nation, uh, good believers, they're able to minister to them, uh, minister to people in the arts and entertainment, right? Then same way, you've got media, you've got uh, business, uh, believers who have started business, who are already in business, right? Uh, uh, how can we minister? How can we, uh, you know, bless them? How can we minister to them so that they can be a blessing to uh, people in the business, right? Then we go to government and family and religion, right? So reaching the influential is not wrong at all. Now the mindset, sometimes we may think, oh, people, what do people think? Don't worry about what people think. Look at this. Zacchaeus was, uh, in Luke 19, 1 to 10, Zacchaeus was the chief collector, a rich man, and yet he was interested in seeing Jesus. Rich man, chief tax collector. He had everything going with him, right? And uh, during those days, the chief, uh, the tax collectors were protected by the Roman government, right? They, were, they had perks, they had everything that they need. They were not under any kind of problem, any kind of suppression. They had a good, enjoyable life. They had all the money that they needed. Now, this Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. What does it teach us? There are many of them who may be highly influential, have a lot of money, they have everything, big house, big car, yet they are like Zacchaeus, seeking for Jesus, waiting to be reached. So we need skilled, qualified people to minister in those areas. Right now. Bible studies uh, are one of the ways we can minister to them, right? Uh, now, again, if you know that God is opening a door in the corporate sector, we got to have the right people ministering to them right? uh, at their level to understand their level of of thinking, their level of uh, you know reasoning. You must be able to raise up people now. Now, even as I'm sharing all this, remember, uh, you, know, you may think, hey, I've just started my church. What is all these? You know, how do I go to all these places? How do I do it? Now, think ahead. You've, you've started your church now, so maybe two years down the line. These are doors that God is opening. You pray and ask God to open these doors. Right? Uh, new ways of ministry must be encouraged in your church remember if your church is only centered around sunday service and church growth it's good sunday service is important church growth important but if it's only centered around that what will happen we cannot be a blessing to others you will not be able to uh, you know the lord we need to ask God to open the doors as a church, right? So it's not just Sunday and life group, but it's much more than that, right? Have the bigger vision, right? And then uh, using tools like printed books. Uh, we talked about this last week, right? Pamphlets, newspaper pamphlets, newspaper inserts, internet, social media, television, music, performing arts, uh, Bible studies, and now with online, Right. A lot of our folks, uh, a lot of people are watching online right? uh, with, with uh, you know, Internet being widely used everywhere. Uh, you know, our reach is much, much, much more. So, again, leveraging the tools that we have. Right. So these are certain guidelines, regulations that we can think about, strategies that we can think about. But even as you prepare for this, uh, it's very important as a leader, as a pioneer, to prepare guidelines, prepare regulations, pre choose the right person, the right team, 
come up with the right ministry name. All of these are important aspects. Right now, so, you know, sometimes it may look like a daunting task. You may say, Pastor, why don't I just start the church, have Sunday sermons, just have life groups, men's ministry, women's ministry, youth youth meeting? Yeah, that's that's the that we want to do that. But uh, what did Jesus say? Go and make disciples. Go out. Don't just. It's not only in the church, right? Uh, any questions before we go into chapter 13? We're going to look at the seven mountain assignment a little more in detail. The seven spheres of influence, how you and I can uh, minister and penetrate through these seven mountain assignment. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead, we'll continue. So the seven mountain, where, where did this, uh, this phrase, where was it coined? Uh, 1975, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade uh, and Youth with a Mission, uh, you know, they came up with this, this whole aspect of impacting the nation of Jesus Christ. And, and then when they were sitting, talking, they were discussing, they came up with seven main pillars of society. Right. Seven pillars, seven places which encompass everyone in a certain city or a nation. Right. Seven pillars of society. So then later on, uh, it, the, the phrase seven mountain uh, came, it came to be known as the seven mountain or the seven spheres. All of this is for communication purposes. But today, let's now let's look at the seven mountains. Right, or the seven pillars, the seven spheres of influence in any society. This will be there in any nation. Be there. Right. At least for most of the urban uh, nations. Right. Okay, let's look at the first one. Family. Now, family is the institution set up by God. Right. Second one, religion includes the church and the people of God. Education, which is schools, colleges, academic, media, which is all forms of print, newspaper, TV, internet, arts and entertainment, uh, sports, arts, entertainment, which includes everything, dance, cultural activities, business, that is science and technology, innovations, activities, then government. So the judicial system, the legislative, uh, law and the executive law. Right now, in each of these groups, there will be thousands and thousands of people, and thousands and thousands of subgroups in each of these groups. But God wants us to be changing agents in all these spheres. And it was. It, it, it is here that we are able to you know, minister, reach out to people, touch people's lives, right? Believers in the local church must be made aware and equipped on how to impact the seven spheres of the church, right? So for example, church has started, right? It's been two years and you see a youth who has been regular to your church for more than one year now, been regular, He's got a good knowledge of God's word, has been faithful. What you and I can do is begin to mentor and begin to teach and raise up this young boy. He may be working in the corporate sector, he may be a student, but begin to you know, instill values where, hey, you can go and minister to people wherever you are. So if it's in college, you can encourage him, hey, why don't you start? Uh, a Bible study group in your college. Now, has it been done before? It has been done. I remember we had, uh, again, this is early 2000, and I get the years wrong because we've gone to so many places. It could be somewhere around 2017. Uh, we had one of our student, one of our students who are part of our church, and uh, eventually, what happened was he 
he wanted to start a Bible study group in the college, in the college campus. So he got permission from the college. Uh, the college was a Christian college, so they said, okay, you can start, but make sure that you can, you know, you, you use this room, but you're not forcing anybody, you're not uh, distributing any of your pamphlets. So he said, it's fine. So he started with two people in a small uh, place inside the college campus, and this happened during the lunch break. And so the one hour lunch break, 10 minutes have lunch, and then they would meet for about 40 minutes. Uh, um, in for this you know bible study group and so over time what happened was this boy was able to lead this group and the group was became more than about a hundred people that we would go uh, at times he would invite different pastors to come and preach and different uh, people to come and lead worship so we would go and lead the worship minister for about 35 40 minutes in god's word and then come back and he did a wonderful work he was just there for three years in that college he started it when he was in second year so second and third year he did it he was able to lead this team and eventually what he did was he also raised up a leader so that when he moves on from the college graduates and moves on the work will continue now he was he's just a believer in our church but he was able to do it. And so the same way, there will be people that we must train. Like if somebody's in the corporate sector, get them, get them trained. Hey, how do you minister to people in the corporate sector? What is it that you can say? What is it, you know, uh, what are the, uh, of course it takes time, but you train them, you empower them, give them, let them know that as a church, you're there with them, if they need any material, if they need any help, uh, you're there to help them, right? So the challenge, the process, the preparation, the pro the positioning, all of this is very important, right? So the challenge is to preach the gospel to every creature, to every disciple, to, to the nations. Two is the process. How do we plant seeds? How do we make sure, whatever, in every sphere, the seven spheres, how do we plant seeds? What is the process that we're going to use? What are we going to do if the soil is hard? What are we going to do if people are unprepared? What are we going to do if doors open and uh, we get a, we get open doors? Well, how are we going to minister? What, have, what are we going to do if certain doors close? How are we going to prepare? How are we going to position ourselves as a church, right? And then uh, you and I can put the seed and let God multiply it a hundredfold. Right? That's that's just our responsibility. We both put the seed, ask God to multiply it. So again, when we do all of this, what is happening? We have a kingdom mindset. It is not a mindset of, I want my church to grow. Yes, we also want our church to grow. Every pastor, every ministry leader would want their church to grow. But it's beyond that. It's about being a blessing to reach out to minister to every sphere of influence. Right? So how do we transform cultures? How do we impact lives, transform cultures? transform people's minds, their thinking. One, moral biblical principles. Matthew 28, verse 20, let's read that. Matthew 28, 20. Okay, I'll read it and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teaching them model biblical principles. So if you are ministering in a certain place and we and we know that, okay, we, we need to, uh, we want to sow seeds, God's word into their heart. 
model biblical principles. Let the word of God teach them the word of God. The word of God is what will bear fruit in people's lives. Bring the principles of the Bible, all that Jesus taught. Bring it in. There's every still Jesus talked in when you look at Jesus' ministry, he has touched on every sphere of influence. Did he talk about uh, family? Yes. Did he talk about religion? Yes. He said, don't be like those Pharisees and the Sadducees who are like East. But when you pray, go to your father and, uh, and go to your room, pray to your father in private. Has he talked about education? Yes, he has. He, has he talked about, uh, uh, has he ministered to, of course, there's no media, but uh, in, in terms of uh, public communication? Yes, he has. Right? He has touched every form. Right. Uh, every sphere he has touched. And so we can use biblical principles. Now, what if a businessman comes and says, uh, you know, how do I, uh, on what must I type? Should I type my gross or my net income? Right. So model it on principles from the Bible. Right. Of course, it's not written in the Bible, gross and net, but model it the principle is there in the bibles right bring principles biblical principles of integrity excellence kindness justice treating people well uh, uh, this love being patient uh, not being jealous or uh, walking in uh, pride walking in humility model it teach it coach people to live in this kind of a way uh, when we model it, we'll be able to teach it. And when we teach it, people will grasp it. They'll want to follow it. But second way is to let our light shine by our good works. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Shall we read that? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Yes, anyone can read, please? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And give and it give light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sadhushi. So this is the saying, you are the salt, you are the light. Let your light, let your works shine before men that they will glorify the Father in heaven. Right? Uh, so we we can be people who can just walk in these values. Thirdly, engaging in spiritual transformation. Right. Now, the best example would be the Apostle Paul, right? He went to Ephesus, a place which had uh, so much of uh you know, evil, there was uh, sexual immorality, there was sin, that was, all, it was a place where there was idolatry happening there. But he was able to bring in transformation, spiritual transformation in that place. He went to Corinth, again, same thing. He went to Galatia, wherever he went, there was a transformation of the, uh, the, of the place, right? Uh, spiritual transformation. Why? Because he ministered in power. He ministered the word of God. If you read all through the book of Acts, wherever the disciples went, the this, this, this spiritual, uh, you know, the, 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 the place that they were in, the entire spiritual atmosphere changed because they were the salt, they were the light. Their light shone so bright that people saw it and said, hey, 
we want this. And so when you and I also go to places, go to areas, we can be, let our words shine, let our, the work of the Holy Spirit make a change in their lives. Right? And then there is something that is involved, that is preparation. So the first one, first point was the challenge was to preach. Two is the process. That is, how do we go about doing this? Three is preparation. The church has to be prepared, ready, equipped uh, to, to go ahead and do this, uh, to minister to people. Uh, uh, heart prepare, preparation is important, which means uh, guard against uh, you know, uh, lust of the money and power and influence. Have the right attitude why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, keep your desires and motives pure, not to gain recognition, but to glorify God so that the ministry is blessed. Guard your motivations. Why am I doing this? Why am I choosing this? What are my purposes? Um, um, especially when you look at businesses um, and you look at things, people who are working in the corporate sector, you know, we need to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Guard our motivations and guard, guard our character. Character determines our decisions, right? They, we must get, guard ourselves and say, okay, God, I am doing this. Uh, while I'm doing this, help me to conform to your standards. Whether people are watching or not, Help me to walk in Christ's likeness, to walk in integrity, uh, to walk in love, my character, excellence, to walk in compassion. That is what I want to do. Um, and people will notice, people will grasp it. Right? And then there is spiritual preparation, that is modeling biblical principles, uh, tapping into the work of the Holy Spirit through signs, wonders, and miracles, asking God to give us uh, creative ideas, demonstrating wisdom when we talk to people, prophetic, words of knowledge. All of these are the spiritual aspects. And the fourth uh, way of ministering to these spheres of influence is the positioning. We are positioned to influence Jesus. Said in Luke 19, he said, Luke 19, 13, he says, occupy till I come, which means go about, go and do until I come, right? So God can position you in one or more ways, right? We look at that list there as a transformer, as an influencer, as an accessor, as a cross-pollinator, as a trendsetter, and as a catalyst at any level. Transformer, like a Joseph or a Daniel. It transformed the entire society. The entire nation was transformed because of them. Influencer. Esther was able to influence people, the Jews, right? Naman's maid was, Naman was uh, leprosy. She was able to influence Naman, right? Saying, you go and pray and you'll be healed. Accessor. Nehemiah had access to the king. God can open doors and give you access to people in different spheres of society. And through your access, you can bring in God's word. You can bring in the light of God in that place. Cross-pollinator, Moses and Paul, a preacher to those in authority. Right? Moses ministered, Paul ministered. Right? And they, were, they ministered, uh, uh, Paul ministered to the Gentiles, being a Jew, right? so a cross-pollinator a trendsetter and a catalyst at any level. So these are different ways that we can minister. And as a church, especially once you begin your church, begin your ministry, these are those that we can pray and ask God to open for us. Right. So let's close here. Um, and, uh, we will pick up from next week. We'll go to the next topic. We will continue to learn and uh, there are many aspects when it comes to church planting. Uh, so we we'll continue to learn and continue to work together. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless.